All right, well, we are um, wrapping up the Daniel series. Have you enjoyed the Daniel series? It's been insightful. It's been great. Um, I've learned a whole lot. Grateful for our lead pastors. Come on, do you love Pastor Caleb and Chris? You put your hands together if you love them. I've learned a lot in this, in this series, and uh, I have the honor of, of wrapping up the book of Daniel today. Um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Sam. I lead the youth ministry here at Project Church, and uh, in just a few short weeks, we're going to be going off to a summer camp where I will not sleep for three days and three nights. Um, I, I, I will look like I'm addicted to something by the time I get back, but it's just not having sleep. And uh, we're bringing over 90 teenagers this year to summer camp, which is incredible. The first year we threw summer camp, true story, two years ago, the first time we ran summer camp, we brought with us uh, 40 people two years later, bringing over 90 students who are gonna um, have moments in the presence of God. It's gonna change their life forever. Um, and so a couple ways you can partner with us. Number one, if you got a middle school or high school person in your house, student in your house, um, get them registered to go to camp. We have a few more spots, I think three spots left, and we would love to take them. If you don't, um, you can also partner in giving, and we've been talking about this for the last few weeks, but in the Church Center app or even in the receptacle in the back, you can make an offering for um, summer camp scholarship. There's a lot of families that would love to send their, their teenagers that can't fully pay for it. And us as the church, the vernacular and the language that we use is we will not let money be an issue that you can't be at camp this year. Um, and so if you can and you feel led to give, you can do that through the app. Uh, but I'm excited. We're gonna be jumping back in and wrapping up the series of Daniel today. And um, I hope you're ready. I got a message for you in my heart. Are you ready? Today, if you're taking notes, write down the, uh, the title. It's The Frustration of Vision. The Frustration of Vision. Um, you know, I, um, I love Sacramento. Does anybody else in here, you love Sacramento? You just love it. Okay. Now, I got to ask because there's some people that are like, I'm just here for a job. But then there's the people that if you're a Sacramento person, you love the city. I love the city. I love the trees, even though they mess me up when the pollen comes out. I love the Sacramento Kings, even though they break my heart consistently every single year. I'm still praying for them. Um, I, I love the coffee shops. We got the best coffee shop in all of Sacramento right here. Do you know that? And uh, I love the culture. I love the building. I love Sacramento. I've been here my whole life. I don't plan to go anywhere as long as God keeps me here. But I love Sacramento. But there is one thing about Sacramento that I do not like, and it's the parking signs out here. Anybody ever, you ever a problem just getting into parking? The parking structures are terrible. The streets are awful. There's a new parking sign every single week of something that I cannot do out there. And uh, this last week, I was meeting somebody for coffee, and I went out, and uh, I went out. Met them at this new coffee shop. Weird, weird coffee shop in an actual a hotel. It was in the bottom floor of a hotel. I don't even remember what it was called, but I parked there. I'd been there once before. I park here. I go and get coffee. Now, as any good civilized Samaritan person like myself would do, I paid the money for the parking meter. Now, I know some of you aren't on that level yet, and you just watch it, and you just make sure none of the parking meter guys come up, and you're like living in sin a little bit, but I pay the $1.75. I'm not that cheap. I pay the $1.75, and I go inside, and I enjoy my meeting. I don't feel like I got to look back every 30 minutes, and I'm, I'm in this meeting. I paid the parking meter. The light's still green, which means green means green means go. Green is good. So I'm inside enjoying my coffee. We're talking about summer camp, and uh, I see the, the parking meter attendant come up and start running my play, and I go, oh, get behind me, Satan. So I run outside. I'm like, yo, what's the problem? Satan? No, I'm just kidding. I said, what's the problem? <laughs> He's running my plate, and I go, I paid the meter. It's still flashing green. He goes, yeah, but you, you must have not seen the sign. I go, what you mean? I've seen all the signs out here. I've been here before. So I'm looking out, and he said, you didn't see that one? Now, there's a sign on a pole, a light pole, on the opposite side where only somebody walking on the crosswalk would see it. I couldn't see it where I parked, paid the parking meter, and it says you cannot park here every second Tuesday of the month from 9 to 10 in the morning. I say, who makes these rules up 9 to 10 in the morning? So I said, all right, hey, the last time I got in a predicament like this, the, the guy was like, hey, if you sing me a song, I'll let you out of it. I got all undignified. I sang with my heart. I was trying out for the worship team. I'm like, I got a song for you. He let me out of it. True story, the guy goes to church here now every couple weeks. I see him. Um, this guy, he's like, hey, if you move your car, I don't know if he's coming to church, but he's like, I'm like, if I move my car, am I good? So he allows me to move my car, and I didn't get a ticket. And it just dawned on me. I'm like, yo, I had been to this coffee shop before. I had seen all the signs in Sacramento, but there was a hidden sign I didn't see up there. And I can, it doesn't matter, you know, how many times you go somewhere, you can still miss things that are right in front of you. Um, I got a few actually examples of this. How many people been to FedEx in the room before? You ever, you ever sent off a package, received a package? I don't know how many times I've been to a FedEx and I have seen this on commercials. I have seen this when I've walked in. But right there between the E and the X, there is an arrow I had never seen before. Y'all ever noticed this? 
Yeah, some people, you're like, this is crazy. I never, and it stands for how quickly they ship their packages. I've never seen it in my life. How about this one? I love a good ice cream cone on the summer days. Anybody love ice cream? I'm not an advocate for Baskin Robbins. I think handles is much better. If you run a location in here, hook it up. But um, Baskin Robbins is awesome. I will, okay, here we go. Have you ever noticed the 31 in the middle of that? For the 31 flavors they offer at Baskin? Been there so many times. I had never seen it in my whole life. How about this one? I can't tell you how many times I've dove deep into a bag of Tostitos chips at a party and enjoyed it, and I've never seen the two people holding the chip and the bowl of salsa right in the middle of it. Never seen it before. But my favorite one, how about the Hershey's Kisses? I love Hershey's. Have you ever noticed between the K and the I, there's a Hershey Kiss right there? You ever noticed that before? I had never noticed that before. But you know what's crazy? This isn't new. It's been there the whole time. We have seen these things for years and never seen that right there. And it dawned on me that I think a lot of times in life, we can have vision and still not see things that are right in front of us, don't we? And this is what's happening. I'm looking at the parking sign. I'm like, yo, I paid the meter. I'm seeing the Tostitos chips. I love Tostitos. But I've never seen this before. And there could be things right in front of you that you have never seen before And we're going to be jumping in to Daniel chapter 10 in a minute, but I want to ask you this question. I wonder in your life what's been in front of you the whole time and you've never seen it before. I wonder what things you have missed in life because it has come mundane and routine and you have missed something that is so important right in front of you. In Daniel chapter 10, we're going to jump into the scriptures. At this point, um, theologians say, Daniel, he's 84 years old and he gets a dream. Come on, I love that, that the scripture just tells us that because it don't matter. I hear young people all the time say, I'm too young to have vision. I see elderly, elderly people say, I'm, I'm too old to have dreams. But I love that Daniel is 84 years old and the scripture says he gets a dream. You're never too old and you're never too young to have a dream and a vision from God. I love that Daniel is in his old age and he gets a fresh dream in his heart. And it says that Daniel, as he gets this revelation from God, he sees something that's been in front of him his entire life, but he's never noticed it before. So let's turn Daniel chapter 10. We're gonna be reading verses seven through 14. And I didn't do this in the first service and I low key regretted it. So let's stand to our feet as we read God's word together. If you got your paper Bible with you, uh, good for you. There's a fast track line in heaven for you. If you don't have it, God still loves you. Grace upon grace for you. We'll have it on the screen. But it says this in Daniel chapter 10, verses seven through 14. Verse seven, I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. And those who were with me did not see it, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. My face turned deathly pale and I was helpless. Yo, that is a vision. And then I heard him speaking. Now he's talking about an angel speaking to him. Then I heard him speaking. And as I listened to him, I fell into a deep sleep. My face, come on, anybody ever prayed late at night? You just fell asleep praying? It's like what's happening to Daniel. He just fell asleep, right? Your God's speaking to him, just boom, he's out. Verse 10, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up for I have been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. And then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Verse 14, now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Are you ready for the word? I hope you like who you sit next to. Turn to your neighbor next to you and say, I'm glad you're here today. And take a seat, take a seat, take a seat. Some of you, you, turn, you didn't even turn to the person to, to your left. That's messed up. This isn't even a forgiveness message. So what's happening in Daniel chapter 10? Daniel, 
is in his old age, he gets a vision, a revelation from God in, in what it boils down to. I'm not gonna go into all of it. I wanna implore you and encourage you. Read Daniel 12, 10 through 12 on your own. But what's happening in Daniel 10 through 12 is in Daniel 12, the fulfillment of this vision that God gives him is that there would be a day where redemption would happen. Is anybody grateful that Jesus came down, died on the cross for us and promises there'll be a day he comes back and brings us into redemption? Anybody grateful for that? I'm grateful for the good news. But Daniel 10, he gets this vision. And in Daniel 12, the way it sums up is that there'd be a day of redemption where if your name is written in the book of life, you'd be delivered, you'd be changed, you'd go up to heaven. But what happens before the fulfillment of that vision ever comes to pass in Daniel 11, there's a whole breakdown of a giant spiritual battle that would take place. And so what's happening is Daniel gets a wide revelation of what the human life looks like from beginning to eternity. But what this also can boil down to for you and for me is that this is the depiction of the life that you and I have, that we can have vision in life and the frustration and the tension that we feel is the spiritual battle that we are consistently under, whether you know it or not. Something that's been there your whole life that maybe you've never seen before, but Daniel gets a revelation from God and what it does is it builds his faith on how he can fight spiritual battles. And I don't know who I'm talking to today that you are in the middle of a battle in your life, but this message today will hopefully give you some tools on how to fight your battles God's way and not your way. But faith will give you the eyes to see what you have never seen before. So Daniel gets a revelation and his eyes are now changed, not just to seeing what's happening physically, but to what is happening behind the scenes in the spiritual realm. So Daniel, he sees this vision and the scriptures say that he immediately becomes overwhelmed. He loses his strength, he loses his words, he gets weak, he falls down on his hands and his knees. And I think it's because Daniel sees this vision that's so cumbersome, so large that he doesn't know what to do with right away in the beginning. And Daniel understood something, that long before the fulfillment of the vision that I have for my life, the fulfillment, the fulfillment of the vision that God has given me, before this thing ever comes to pass, he understood there would be a spiritual battle. And hear me loud and clear today that if you have a vision from God in your life and in your heart, vision always comes with opposition. You're never gonna have a vision that just happens exactly the way that you want it. Now, if that has happened to you, good for you. God has blessed you. But for the rest of us normal human beings in the room, when we have visions and when we have dreams that God has given us, we gotta understand first and foremost, there's always opposition when there's vision in life, isn't there? And so even though there's opposition, there's a way to fight. So what is vision? I'm thinking about vision. Vision, what it does is it always shows you the future fruit. It shows you the end result of the thing you wanna do, the thing you wanna start, the thing that you desire the most. Vision shows you future fruit, but rarely does it show you the fight that takes place far before the fulfillment ever comes, right? And so what do we do when we're in the middle before we ever get to the fulfillment of the vision? What do we do when there is a fight happening? I wanna ask you today, what's your vision? What's the thing that God has put in your heart? What's the thing that God has put in your mind? What vision do you have that's been frustrated? Is it that you'd be on the golf course with your homies this summer, hitting all your balls straight and making all your putts, but actually instead you're throwing your golf club across the course and you're screaming? Or is that just me? I broke a club last year. <laughs> Pray for your boy, I got anger problems. Would it be that you, you came in here today and you're like, yo, I'm, I'm in my 30s, like I thought I'd be married by now, but I'm still single what vision do you have that's been fresh? It was that you had a business in your heart you wanted to start, but yet you are not making it with enough income to be generous like you first wanted to be? What's the vision that you had would be that your family, your parents, siblings, your kids would one day give their life to Jesus, but yet you look at them and they're so far from him? Can I ask you, what vision do you have right now in your life that feels like it has been frustrated? Because this is the tension that you and I live in. And this is a tension that Daniel faced when he got this vision. There was a tension that he felt frustrated with vision. Have you ever been frustrated with vision before? You ever been frustrated with the way things turned out before? You ever been frustrated with where you are? This is the tension that Daniel was feeling in this moment, the tension and the frustration of vision. In Ephesians chapter six, it, it probably puts it together a whole lot more better than I will. Ephesians chapter six, verse 12, you got your Bible, you can write this in your notes. Ephesians six twelve tells us what the tension is that we face. It says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authority, against spiritual forces. 
The battle and the tension that you and I feel in life is a spiritual battle that's taking place. Please hear me loud and clear today. God's got a great plan for your life. A plan to prosper you, to help you, not to harm you. He's got good things in the future for you. He's got good things he's doing right now for you that you don't know about. But just like God has a plan for your life, please understand this, the devil's got a plan for your life too. And if you're in here today and you're living through that vision, you are trying to accomplish what God has placed in your life and you're feeling opposition, you're feeling resistance, please understand the reality is the only time that you will ever face opposition and tension in your calling and in your purpose is when you are a threat to the devil's plans. Like, why would he make it easy for you to accomplish what God put in your heart? Why would he make it easy for your family to be saved? Why would he make it easy for your business to be a blessing? Why would he make it easy for you to be the first one to have a marriage that is surrendered and submitted to God? Why would he make it easy? So the moment you infringe on the devil's plans is the moment resistance is in. So I want to encourage somebody real quick that you felt resistance as you've been following God. There's been opposition as you've been trying to follow God and you haven't been able to put language on it. Can I tell you that the resistance is required for your growth? The vision needs resistance and it means that you are moving in the right direction. Too many times people pray, God, take me out of this. And it's like, yo, if you understood the resistance that you're feeling is indication you're moving in the right direction, you should welcome it at all costs. I'm glad there's resistance. I'm glad there's opposition. I'm glad it's not easy because I'm growing and I'm moving at the rate God wants me to move at. So opposition and resistance is required for your vision. I was at the gym recently and... um, working out and I go to the gym. I was, I was sharing this at 830. Um, now that I got twins at home, a lot of you parents, you know this, um, when they take a nap and your spouse is home, you're like, I gotta run to the gym as fast as I can. They're gonna be asleep for an hour and a half. So it's a 15 minute drive there, a 15 minute drive back. I got 45 minutes to work out and this is how my mind works. So I gotta get in the gym and I gotta work out so fast that I don't breathe for 45 minutes and I nearly die every single time. I got creatine pumping through my body. Like I gotta get this done. And I'm talking, I don't go in there and talk. Like, I'm just, I'm not the guy like, hey, don't build community with me at the gym. I got 45 minutes. I'm here for a purpose, okay? So I'm in the gym and this guy comes up and talks to me. And I'm like, all right, I'll talk to this dude. So we're talking for a little while, longer than I wanted to, to be honest. And uh, he's in a lot better physical shape than me. My God, the guy looked like Goliath. He was huge. I'm like, whatever you're doing is working, bro. And uh, this guy comes up as we're talking and interjects in our conversation. And he, uh, he does the whole like up down look. You know what I'm saying? Like he looks at me, he goes, and then he looks at the guy that's, that I'm talking with, a lot better shape. He goes, hey, bro, to the other guy. Hey, bro, so what do you think I should do? I'm trying to get bigger. I'm like, yeah, that doesn't insult me. I understand. I would have chose him too. <laughs> and so he's talking to the guy. And he's asking him for a tip. He's like, I want to get stronger in this certain area, this certain muscle group. I've been working out for a while. I haven't been able to really see a lot of strength in this one area. What do I do? Now, I'm all ears because I need it too. And he's like, here's what you need to understand. A lot of people, they come to the gym and they think two things. There's kind of two general rules of thought. Number one, I come in, I'm gonna lift very heavy weight and do low repetition thinking I'm gonna get bigger. He said the second type of person is the one that comes in thinks I'm just gonna do like 10 million bench presses. You know, like it's like the old man with a two and a half just for like 30 straight minutes. Like my God, this guy's strong. He's like, they think you just do low weight for like an hour and I'm in high repetition, you're gonna get strong. He's like, the real ingredient to success that I have found is that when you practice this principle where you find something that you can do eight to 10 reps of and you do it not very fast and not very slow, but you do it at just the right speed, he's like, it's a principle called time under tension. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, time under tension. He says, you wanna get weight that's just bearable enough where you can get eight to 10 reps out, but it's hard every time you're going slow. And I felt like the Holy Spirit encouraged me in that moment. He said, I know that the weight of vision at times can feel like it's crushing you. I know at times the weight of purpose can feel like it's crushing you. I know the weight of having right relationships, honoring God, career. I know it can feel like it's crushing you at times, but if you would see that the tension that you are under, that time that you're under the tension is where your strength is built. That's where your faith is built. That's where your resilience is built. So instead of asking God to remove you when tension gets heavy, ask God, be with me in the tension. Give me the strength I need in the tension. And so for those of you who came in here today, you're like, yo, there is a lot of tension that I'm under, a lot of weight that I'm carrying. First and foremost, it would be unbiblical if I didn't tell you, you need to surrender that. Cast your anxieties and your cares at the feet of Jesus. You're not meant to carry them. But if there is tension on your life, resistance, and there is opposition, and it is heavy, please hear me. The wrong prayer might, not, the wrong prayer might be, God, take me out of it. The right, the right prayer might be, God, give me the strength so that I can grow in it. 
Because the time you are under tension is where your strength will be built. So Daniel, he gets this vision and he begins to see what, he, what had been there the whole time. He saw that there was both future fruit to come, good things to come, but he saw that there was a current battle and fight that he was going to have to face long before it ever came. I kind of equate it to this, like becoming healthy, it's a whole lot more than running 10 miles or lifting weights for an hour. It's having a great, a great diet, isn't it? Having a healthy marriage is more than dink money. If you didn't know what that is, it's double income, no kids, and sex. It's also fighting for connection. You gotta understand that these things, in life, building a business to honor God is more than just getting more revenue. It's how can I be generous with what God has given me? There is both battles and blessings with everything in life. In the moment we have the vision to see what is actually taking place, we will learn how we are supposed to fight the battles of life. But oftentimes what I have noticed is in today's culture more than ever, with Instagram, with social media highlights, we live in a, a culture of constant comparison wanting to be like somebody else. But you know what comparison will tell you? Comparison tells you that you can have what somebody else has without ever walking through what they had to walk through. And so if you want the fruit that somebody else has, you better start saying, I'm willing to go through what they went through. Because while you see the fruit, you don't see the fire they walked through. You don't see the fights they had to endure. And so you gotta understand me, there is always with vision going to be both battles and there's going to be blessings. And I love that it says that Daniel's vision, it terrified him. Dude couldn't even stand up. He's trembling. It's like me after a 30-minute leg workout, just shaking. <laughs> He's trembling, doesn't know what to do. And I think it's because he understood that the weight of the vision that he had could not be fulfilled without God. And I wanna help somebody in here that you're a visionary. You wanna do things. You wanna honor God with your life. You wanna see his kingdom built on the earth. The whole reason we're in a kingdom series, building the kingdom of God on the earth. Um, you need to get vision in your life that can't be fulfilled in your own strength. You need to get vision in your life that can only be fulfilled if God shows up. That can only be fulfilled if God does the work. You need vision this big where it is a little terrifying, but please understand me, the moment you get vision for your life this big, you gotta understand there's a certain way you gotta fight your battles. And how you fight your battles, it matters. Look what the angel tells Daniel. The angel speaks to Daniel. He says, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, and I could really preach that if I had another 20 minutes. Some of y'all, you, you need to just ask God for more understanding rather than more blessings and you need to humble yourself. But I don't got time for that. Some of y'all, you can work through that with God on your own. But he says, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response. And the confidence that's built here is the confidence that tells you when you pray, God listens. And when you pray, God responds. This is good news. This should encourage you and edify you to get back to a place of prayer rather than making it happen in your own efforts. Because look what the angel doesn't tell Daniel. The angel doesn't say to Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, he didn't say, you worked so hard. I'm so proud of you. Now I'm gonna bless you. Good job, son. Good job, daughter. He doesn't say, since you gained understanding and asked for your heart to be humbled, he doesn't say that you, that you, you made the right connections. You rubbed shoulders with the right people. You knew the right people. It doesn't say that. It says, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding in your heart to be humbled, your words were heard and I've come in response to them. And some of you, you need to rest from your performance. Some of you need to stop trying to earn God's approval that he's already given you. Some of you need to stop caring so much about the applause of man and realize it's an audience of one. Some of you, you need to stop living your life for what other people think and know you're approved, you're accepted, and you're loved and he will come in response to your prayer. But you gotta humble yourself. Gaining understanding and humbling yourself. So Daniel understood that vision required resistance, but he also understood that vision required repetitive prayer. We see Daniel's theme of his life. Morning, noon, and night, Daniel prayed three times a day. Daniel, in exile, trained in the king's, in the king's house. Fast without, wherever he's eating the best meat, the filet mignon, that's what I call it. That's, if you want to call it that, you can call it that. Filet mignon. He has, they got the wine, they got the whole thing. They got a charcuterie board. My God, this place is like heaven. But he's like, no, I don't want any of that. I'm going to take the vegetables and the water. No, thank you. And um, 
He looks better than everybody else. He, he, he's promoted, he's leading now. And his, he, he knows one thing, that even though I've gotten to where I am, I didn't get here without God. I need to keep praying. Some of you, you pray until you get the blessing and then you forget about him. Some of you, you need to keep, because if he brought it to you, he's the only one that can sustain it. He's the only one that can sustain that marriage he gave you. He's the only one that can sustain that, that business that he gave you. He's the only one. So Daniel marks his life, I'm gonna be a man of repetitive prayer three times a day because vision requires repetitive prayer. Do you know what prayer shows everybody? But most importantly, what prayer shows God? Prayer reveals a heart that's surrendered, but works reveal a heart that is in control. And the reality is this, is if you are not praying, you are saying, I got this in my own strength. I'll make it happen on my own. My performance can do itself. Please understand me, you can earn what only a human can earn, but by prayer, you can only get what God would give you. And if you begin to live a life where you say, I'm going to live my life by being open-handed and letting go, do you know what happens? The moment you open your hands and let go to God is the only time that he can ever put something in your hands that you can hold on to again. And some of you, you haven't learned even the principle yet of tithing, where God says, give me the first 10%. Why the first 10? Because it's the hardest 10 to give. He doesn't ask for the last two. He doesn't ask for a tip. He doesn't ask for what you have after everything's paid for. He says, give me the first 10% because the moment you let go is the moment I can increase and fill your hands with more. And you need to step out and say, God, I'm gonna trust you with my 10%. Some of you, you don't have godly community around you. Your, your relationship right now is not honoring God and you want a godly relationship. Please understand me, until you choose to open your hand and let go of control, God cannot give you something's healthy if you're holding on to what's unhealthy. Prayer will reveal surrender, but works will always reveal your desire for control. But the reality is this, I, I don't wanna share a message even briefly on prayer and make it sound like prayer is only something where it's you come to God to receive, that makes you a spoiled child. Prayer is not just for you to receive, prayer is so that your heart could be renovated because the greatest blessing of life is not that your financial portfolio increases, your business gets bigger, you can do all these other things with your money and buy a bigger house. The, prayer is not just about receiving. Prayer is about your heart being renovated. Did you know that the greatest blessing God could ever do for you is remove anger and give you peace? Remove anxiety and give you joy? Remove depression and give you hope? But this doesn't happen if all we ever do is ask God to give me more, more money, more things, more. What if the prayer that you need to pray is God change my heart? Not my will, but your will be done. I don't want to live life in my plan and my abilities. I want it to be yours. And you know what happens? You become more like Jesus when your heart's renovated. Can I tell you that the greatest privilege and honor of life is that at the end of life, you make that your prayer. The greatest blessing of life is not that you increase. The greatest privilege of your life is that you become more like Jesus. Can you imagine what marriages would look like if you look more like Jesus? Can you imagine what your community would look like if you look more like Jesus? Can you imagine what the church would look like if you look more like Jesus? But you gotta first understand that prayer is not just about receiving. It's about God renovating your heart and getting rid of the decay and the mold and the brokenness and making something that was ugly beautiful again. And this is what happens in the place of prayer. Look what 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says. It says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. You're like, yo, what's that mean? What's a stronghold? A stronghold is simply this. It's something that the devil just wants to get a grip on your life wherever he can get it. And if it's through bad, ungodly relationships, he wants to get a grip on your life. If it's through greed and lust, he wants to get a grip on your life. Whatever the, the thing that you've opened the door to, the stronghold means that the devil wants to get a grip on your life wherever he can get it. But, he, but Paul says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, meaning we can't fight a spiritual battle physically. We can't fight against the attack of the enemy physically. That means that we have to humble ourselves and say, God, if it's not my battle, I'm gonna trust you in a place of prayer. And some of you, you need to make your prayer closet the most frequented place of your life. Some of you, it's become the place where you go to when only you need something, but I promise you, you go there, your heart will be renovated and you will begin to see, God, these battles are not mine. Daniel sees this massive vision and all that it tells him and reminds him is, you can't do this without God. Can I remind you in this room, whatever your life looks like, whatever your current battle is right now, you can't do it without God. And you can try, but it's gonna be like running on a treadmill that you really go, you're running fast, but you're going nowhere. 
But the moment you choose to say, God, I'm going to surrender this, he's gonna remind you. And here's what the book of Psalms says. It's incredible. It says, be still and know that I am I'm God. Meaning, if you're not still, you might not see God be God. If you're always trying to play God, you don't need him. But when you are still is when you see God in all of his strength and all of his grace, who God really is, show up in your life. I would rather get humbled in the place of prayer than make every battle just about what I can do. Daniel, his whole life been interpreting visions. His friends were thrown into the fire for honoring God. He is thrown into the lion's den for honoring God. And now at the age of 84, he sees what it has been all along. It's been a spiritual battle. Friend, as you look back on your life, you look at your current situation, whatever you've went through, whatever you faced, can I tell you, it's been a spiritual battle. And Daniel finally has eyes to see the spiritual battle that has been taking place. And I love when I meet with people, I say, that are going through hard times, I say, what, what's going, what are you doing right now to grow in the middle of this, this, this challenging time? 90% of the time, it's, I'm, I'm, just, I'm trying. I said, okay, great, trying's a good place to start. What are you doing to try? Tell me the X and the O's. What exactly are you doing to try? I said, I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just trying. I said, well, if you're not trying practically to do things, you're just actually not trying at all. So my advice is that people need to stop trying and they need to start training, training themselves to be in prayer, training themselves to daily surrender themselves to God, daily surrender their, their life to God, daily get back to the word of God, daily make habits. You gotta start training yourself because they're not natural. You gotta start training yourself not to be on social media first. You need to start training yourself to be generous and taking care of others before yourself. You have to train yourself. So you gotta stop trying and you gotta start training in your life to grow wherever you are right now. And I love that the angel shows up and it says, Daniel, he falls on his hands and his knees. And this is the, the, the vision that's happening. Daniel falls down, the angel says, stand up, Daniel. I can only imagine he can hardly stand. And this is his confession to the angel. He goes, he goes, I'm weak, I'm weak, I'm speechless. I don't know if you've been there before. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. I'm frustrated, I'm tired, I'm weary. And Daniel, before the angel, he admits where he is, I'm weak. And it serves as a reminder for you and I that you can never get healed unless you first admit that you're sick. And you can never get hope unless you first admit that you're broken. And you can never find joy unless you first admit that you're depressed. And you can never get God's help unless you first ask him for it. And so he's sitting there, he goes, I'm weak. And the angel walks up to him and he touches him he stands up and it says that he was given strength in that moment. He said, I, I, don't, I don't have words to say. I don't know what to say. It says the angel touches his lips and gives him the words to say. And let me just encourage you. The angel came in response to his prayers, but even then he didn't know what to do. He didn't have the strength. He didn't have the words, but he asked for it and God gave it to him. I don't know what you need today. I don't know if you're tired. I don't know if you're weary. I don't know if you're burnt out. I don't know if you're depressed. I don't know if you're sick. I don't know what is going on in your life, but you know who does? And the caveat to getting what you need is you gotta be willing to ask for it. But this takes a humble heart. Daniel admitted, I am weak. I'm tired. But when you admit where you are, God can give you what you need. Please hear me loud and clear. God will always give you what you need every time, but you have to ask. And God will do for you what you can never do for yourself. Do you hear me? But he won't do for you what you can do for you. And some of you, you have the strength to stand up like the angel told Daniel. He said, stand up and I'll give you what you need. And some of you, you have the strength to do the thing that God's asked you. But then there's some vision that you know, I can't do it without God. And that's where he shows up. I'll carry you. I'll guide you. I'll grace you, but you have to first be willing to admit where you are. I love what C.S. Lewis says. He writes this, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pains. God is trying to get a hold of you. Do you hear me? God is trying to speak to you. You just gotta start saying, God, would you open up my ears to hearing you? I don't hear you right now. God, would you open up my eyes to seeing you when I don't see you? God, would you open up my heart to be softened so I can receive when you show up? He's trying to get a hold of you. And when he shows up, can we not be so prideful 
as to think, I got this on my own. But to say, God, I'm weak. I'm tired. I don't know what to do. I'm in a battle. And when you do it and you begin to hear God's voice, he gives you the strength that you need. So whatever your current battle is, you cannot win it in your own strength. You can keep trying. I think God looks down at us and loves us and he's got a, 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 a father's smile and he goes, dang, they're so cute. They're trying so hard. <laughs> oh, you're doing so good, little buddy. But if you just trust me, I'll, I'll help you. I'll guide you through this. I'll give you the strength that you need. Please hear me. You cannot win all of your battles in your own strength. Do you know why? Because purity is a far bigger spiritual battle than you know. Giving and being gener having a life of generosity is more spiritual than you know. Your marital struggles are more spiritual than you know. Your anxiety is far more spiritual than you know. How could you win that on your own? Let me tell you, you can't. But you can choose to humble yourself. And so God can give you what you need. What if the only thing you needed to do to receive today is to humble yourself? Will you? Man, I'm just gonna say it. I'm tired of the church being comprised of strong women and weak men. Man, we need to stand up. We need to stop serving in the shadows. We need to be the ones up here in the prayer. We need to be the ones leading our homes. Man, we gotta be stronger. We gotta follow after God the way he's called us to. Please understand this. We gotta humble ourselves. Not just the ladies, men. Humble yourself. You are missing what God wants to give you because you are pride. I don't care what you sound like. I don't care what you look like when you cry. God has something for you, but will you humble yourself in order to see it? You gotta humble yourself. Vision reveals victory, but understand this, while you might see the victory, the fulfillment of the vision that God has placed in your heart, it could look a whole lot different than you ever thought. Some of you thought by this point I'd have this thing, by that point I think I'll have that thing, but God has a way of getting in and disrupting and changing the things and the plans that we have. He thinks our plans are awesome and cute, but he changes them because he changes our heart and our heart's desires. I think, why do you think the scriptures tell us that God will give us the desires of our hearts? Because when he changes our hearts, our desires become more godly. Our desires become something that honors him and it's not just something that honors us. So God will change the desires of your heart, but would you be okay today? If God changed the vision in your life, would you be okay? Because a mature church and mature followers of Jesus gotta understand that. You cannot be more married to the gift than you are to the gift giver. You cannot be more married to God answering your prayer of healing than you are to the healer. You cannot be more attached and in love with the provision rather than you are the provider. You gotta mature past the point, say God, even if I don't get what I've asked for and prayed for, I'll still choose you. I'll still follow you. I'll still lay my life down because your way is better than my way. Jesus in the garden said, if you can take this cup from me, but not my will, your will. Are you willing to say, I'm not more married to my vision than I am to Jesus. I, not my will, but your will be done. And when you make this your heart's posture, God begins to change things on the inside of you. Look what it says, and we're closing here. The angel tells Daniel in chapter 12, the ultimate gift of life. It's this, everyone's name who is written in the book of life will be delivered. What does that mean? Anyone who said, I'm choosing to put my faith and my trust in Jesus and choosing his plan for my life and not my own. It says that there will be a day where you will be delivered after the time of testing, after the spiritual battles, in the end of your life, there will be deliverance. But there's a second part. It doesn't just end there. A few verses later, the angel tells Daniel this, but many will be purified, made spotless and refined. Do you understand that the battle that you're in right now, God can refine you in, God can purify you in, that you can come out of the fire better than the way you went into it, only if you humble yourself and seek his face in prayer. He said the ultimate gift of life is that you will be delivered. But understand, he doesn't say that the ultimate gift of life is that you'll be more blessed, you'll have more income, you'll have all these things to show for the Instagram followers. He said the end result is that you'll be delivered, purified, and made spotless. 
Come on, by the end of my life, I wanna look more like Jesus than I do right now. Come on, at the end of my life, I want the people around me to love God just like I love God. I want a community of people that looks like Jesus, not because I was the best example, but because I just made the decision, follow me as I follow Jesus. Follow me as I follow Jesus. I might mess up, I might might stumble, I might fail from time to time, but I'm just gonna keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. And I want the people around me to love him at the end of my life too. So I don't know what your vision is today that's been frustrated, but here's what what I'm gonna end. I think the only reason Daniel had the the, the faith to stand firm in the midst of all the battles and the ones that were to come is in the beginning of the scripture in Daniel chapter 10, verse seven, he's having this conversation with the angel. And this is what happens. It said that Daniel was the only one who saw the vision. Can I just tell you right now, if you're the only one that sees the vision for your marriage honoring God in the future, you keep trusting him. If you're the only one who sees the vision for that lost family member coming to Christ when everybody else has walked away, you stay committed. If you're the only one who sees the vision for your business honoring God and building the kingdom of God on the earth, even though it's struggling, you keep building. If you're the only one who sees the vision today, don't quit on it. Do you know why? Because not only was there a promise of deliverance, but as it ended, this is what John, I wanted to end here, John 16, this is what it says, Jesus is talking, and he said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have already overcome the world. I've overcome every battle. I've overcome every obstacle. I've overcome every mountain that you face. I've overcome every spiritual fight you're in. Whatever you're in right now, it's already overcome. Do you know what it requires of you? Humbling yourself in prayer. God, show me how you're gonna carry me through. God, give me the strength to keep moving when I can't do it in my own strength because there's a reality that if he gave you a vision, he's the only one that can fulfill that vision. Your job is not to be the fulfiller. Your job is the one who seeks him in prayer. The Bible reminds us that if you seek him earnestly, you will find him and he will show up in response to your prayers. Can you stand up? I wanna pray and I want us to get outside to celebrate some baptisms. I wanna ask you to close your eyes. I wanna pray for some people in here who maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. You came in here today and you are searching for a living hope. Today, friend, is your day. You're not here on accident. God brought you into this room for a reason to remind you that he sees you, he loves you, he's got a great plan for you, and today is your day. But maybe you've been running and you need to recommit your life to him. With every eye closed, if that's you, you need to give your life back to Jesus. Or maybe for the first time today, would you just lift up your hand all over the room? I wanna know exactly who I'm praying for. I'm gonna ask you to leave those hands up. I don't want those hands going down. This is one of the greatest decisions you could ever make. Jesus, with every hand lifted in this room, I thank you that it's an outward expression of what you're doing on the inside of their heart right now. I pray that you would remind them that it's not in their power, it's not in their performance, it's not in their, their, their good works that can ever achieve what faith does. But we thank you today, Jesus, that you came to, the, came to earth, you died on that cross for our sins, and you set us free, and you rose from that grave as a reminder that salvation is in you and in you alone. And as we lift our hands today, it's a sign of surrender. We want you what you want. We want to live the life that you have for us and nothing else. In Jesus' name, come on, can you say amen? Can you put your hands together? There's quite a few hands in the room. I missed the chance to count them. Secondly, as the band begins to sing, y'all can you sound better than me, y'all start singing. I wanna pray for you, Jesus. I thank you for every person that gathered in your house, the house of prayer today. I pray that you'd remind them that whatever vision that you've placed on their life, there is a victory coming. Whatever battle they face right now, we surrender it to your feet. We trust you that you're good, that you're God, that you work all things together for our good. And so we sing and we declare in this place, you're gonna bring the victory over every situation and over every battle. You're the one who will bring the victory. We trust you in Jesus' name.